Okay, very good morning. I hope everyone is well. Tuesday, 27th of August, uh, getting straight into the, the briefing. As you can see from the side of me, got the uh, calendar highlights for the week ahead. So we're going to discuss where uh, some of the interest might be over the coming uh, trading sessions. Obviously, a UK bank holiday yesterday, so beautiful sunshine. hope everyone uh, had their sun cream on. Um, bank holiday though meaning that volumes yesterday particularly light I think the S&P traded volume was about 20% lower than normal which is absolutely to be expected uh, and so yesterday's session relatively uh, quiet as the G7 was kind of wrapping up and that really is going to dominate much of our discussion uh, for the briefing this morning um, otherwise quick look at the charts then uh, as to how we reside at the moment it's uh, as again fairly benign opening I would say we have slightly lower index futures in the equity space um, what has been an incredibly volatile period for US equities as we're, we're going to look at Donald Trump is I don't think he himself can make his mind up at the moment about how he wants to approach um, dealing with the trade talks with China uh, but overall a fairly more conciliatory tone in the G7 did see equities just creep up a little yesterday, but just giving back a touch this morning. Uh, gold, slightly positive, but again, fairly uh, contained price action, certainly seen overnight, just a little bump as Europe's come in this morning. Uh, in addition, the US 10-year is up about seven ticks uh, at the moment in the currency space. Dollar index, uh, slightly softer, and that is just lending its hand to some very moderate support to euro dollar and cable at the moment. Uh, but again, as per usual, I'll let Sam take care of the, the technical look at the markets. I'll just wrap up some of the main headlines, which starting with the G7, um, you'll remember, and actually one of the first charts I want to jump to is it's actually this. And this is looking at the S&P 500 and one day percentage change. And as you can see, this encapsulates the, the kind of year to date price activity of the S&P. But what's really quite in stark contrast to the rest of the year is these real extremities that we've been seeing in price movement on the daily close in the S&P. Kind of episodes of multi percent, um, when I say multi, I mean two plus percent, getting close to three percent losses on three occasions in August. Um, One percent being fairly common on the upside in recoveries. So just absolutely seesaw as markets react and try to um, remain fairly agile to respond to the latest developments on the trade war situation. Kind of Trump ramping it up, China responding, then Powell coming in, that adverse feedback loop we kind of talked about. But the problem is, is that, you know, when Jerome Powell spoke at the end of last week, it was almost, and Sam making the point this morning, it was almost like Trump absolutely lost his mind for a period of a couple of hours. I mean, he even spelt Powell's name wrong with the first tweet. And the markets just collapsed at that point. Uh, and then it was followed up with at the G7. Uh, this came out. <clears throat> this was really at the beginning of the G7. So this was like on Saturday. Uh, they have uh, altered the headline a little bit. But originally it was asked, President Trump asked about whether he could rethink tariffs. He said, sure, why not? Um, and kind of roll back everything that he was doing at the end of last week. Um, saying that he was having you know, the idea that he was having second thoughts. However, as you can tell by the headline, the White House pretty quick to come out and say, well, hang on, that wasn't the case. But such is Trump's want and need to try and massage the, the market sensitivity in the right fashion that he needs, which is positive equity response. You know, it's been a lot, lot, lot of volatility to try and pick through. Now, a few other things that have been happening. Um, Overall, the closing statements given by uh, Macron and Trump, Trump left the G7 taking a slightly more conciliatory tone as being the general takeaway on China. Uh, he pointed to recent calls and a speech by China's top negotiator signs that Beijing wanted a deal. And so therefore he's still of this belief that you know there's a great deal coming. However, <laughs> That journalist who essentially writes for editor of the, the Global Times, one of the state-run uh, Chinese publications on Twitter, and he's been very much the voice piece uh, on that social platform for responding to Trump. Um, they said that, based on what I know, Chinese and US top negotiators didn't hold a phone call in recent days. 
the two sides have been keeping in technical uh, contact at a technical level. It doesn't have significance that Trump suggested. China didn't change its position and China will not cave to US pressure. So as much as Trump at the G7 said we've had really positive phone calls, China have basically said, no, we haven't. So there's been a real, I feel, distinct shift here, which I think ultimately might even lend its hand to continued volatility because I really do think that China now have, have really seemed to have hit their stop and have had enough and they're definitely taking a different approach now and it almost feels like Trump is chasing a little bit to, ma to manage this and hence the reason why you're getting this flip-flopping in communication which is highly destabilizing as far as market movement is concerned and I do actually think that this is going to continue going forward. Um, this was another important tweet because originally this was the Washington Post one here down the bottom. Trump said he regrets China trade dispute after recent escalation. So this is in reference to Friday. But then China came back and said regret. This should be seen as President Trump changed his tone after ordering US companies to leave China. Regardless of his specific expression each time, we're taking, we're seriously making preparations for scenario in which China-US trade relations deteriorate further, even much worse than now. So again, it's almost like China's calling his bluff now. And I think Trump potentially getting a little twitchy, um, given the fact that China's saying quite openly and explicitly here, well, we're willing to let things get worse. And the fact now that China, if you remember, has managed to um, control this uh, or devalue this symbolic importance of seven with the Chinese yuan against the US dollar. I do think now that does give them some more room for maneuver, given they know now that there isn't going to be this mass exodus of capital outflows out of their country, which was before a slight, <coughs> a slight risk. So, yeah, lots have been happening. I think from a trade point of view, I definitely think that, as I said, this pattern of price activity of large daily intraday swings, I think, will continue for the moment. Um, and if anything, I think if Trump does start to, um, to lose a little bit of control, that means he inevitably needs to start sounding more positive. And if anything, does that start to like translate into more positive market movement again? Because it seems as though Powell definitely is not going to be his saviour at this point. Not unless there is a dramatic um, shock in markets where the Fed are forced then into action, into to easing further. But at this point, Fed still going to cut 25 basis points in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and still market pricing in multiple cuts thereafter. Um, but this trade narrative certainly, I think, is going to be still a tricky one to manage if you're trading intraday and I, all I would say is that I think you've just got to be super vigilant in the intraday environment in terms of actively managing your trades perhaps not sitting in anything for too longer a period than what is necessary um, so that kind of more prudent approach to the timing and duration of trades might be uh, a good way of going about trying to evade some of the fundamental risk to these headlines and tweets. Some of the other things that came out of the G7 was um, the French president doing his best to try and um, bring forward a kind of a solution in towards this conflict that's been growing in the Persian Gulf between Iran and particularly the US. And so he tried to uh, instigate talks between the two parties. And Trump, as much as he said that under the right conditions, he would be up for having face-to-face -face talks with Iran. Iran's Rouhani has come out this morning and said that there's no talks with the US until sanctions are lifted, of which you would imagine is incredibly unlikely to happen. So that being said, uh, it was all the best will in the world from the French president to try and get this over the line. It doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon. Then Boris Johnson, he was obviously his first outing on the international scene, if you like, and apparently handling himself relatively well in respect to definitely no blunders. I think he's, it's that usual Boris kind of tactic of, um, you know, his kind of charm offensive in just being, um, you know, fairly almost lighthearted, uh, pretty charismatic in a way. And that seems to have gone down fairly well with his European partners. However, 
the status quo remains. Uh, Johnson said he was prepared to take Brexit talks with the European Union down to the very last minute before the October 31st exit deadline and if necessary to take a decision to leave without a deal on that day. So there was nothing really that came out of concrete nature from Europe or Britain. The only thing was is that you know, no one was uh, offended in any way, which means that with, what, 63 odd days, I think it is, left, uh, they're still looking to cut a deal at this point to avert the worst case scenario. So yeah, I wouldn't say this is a direct by the pound situation, but it certainly was worst case uh, avoided in terms of absolute loggerheads between all of the European officials and Boris, which did not occur. Uh, the other thing, this is outside of the G7 to be aware of. Um, again, reduced risk in regards to what was an episode of uh, kind of yield spiking in Italy as spreads wi uh, were widening and the FTSE MIB was under pressure on the back of potentially new snap elections, which could have led, if polls are to believe, to a more uh, nationalist-led uh, potential push close to an overall majority, or if not, a coalition leading on the, the way of um, the League under Matteo Salvini. But that's looking like a lesser and lesser uh, outcome, given the fact that now the the DP party and the Five Star look to be pretty close to forming uh, a solution ahead of what is a deadline this week where they need to put forward uh, a new combination of political parties after the plug was pulled on the League and the Five Star about two weeks ago. The only thing that's uh, causing a little bit of friction at the moment between those two parties is who's going to be uh, the, the Premier. Roberto Fico is being put forward um, whereas the five-star leader would prefer the reappointment of Conte, who's the, the current person uh, at the helm at the moment. So overall, uh, risk dissipating over Italy, and so you'd be looking for that to be responded to in, in the appropriate fashion, spread tightening, uh, and if anything, supporting of their local equity market, uh, and an element to help support the euro, for, at least for the moment, uh, in that respect. However, for the euro, there's a lot of other stuff going on, of course. Um, looking at the calendar for the week ahead, a um, few things to be aware of, and I'll just I'll just touch upon the highlights. Really, as we get to Thursday, we get the second reading of U.S. Uh, GDP. Obviously, going to be interesting to see the scope and size of any potential revision to the advanced reading. And then on Friday, you get the flash Eurozone CPI reading, and of course, always an important measure, just given how generally lackluster inflationary conditions have been in the likes of Eurozone, Japan and so on that has led to this more dovish sounding central banks that we've had on a, on a global level. Uh, and then going into the weekend uh, you get Chinese manufacturing, non-manufacturing PMI which is going to be important to follow of course as to continue to see uh, the severity of the, uh, the significance of the trade deterioration that we've had with the US and its impact on the underlying Chinese economy. So that's pretty much uh, the general gist of it, I'd say actually, despite all of these scheduled calendar events of which you can access on my uh, Twitter account, but Sam will issue it within the weekly statue report later this morning, but I'd say the main thing you want to be looking at that's going to be the, the pivotal kind of driver of sentiment for this week remains the trade war ongoing between the US and China. Uh, and at the moment, it's hard to call about where that is heading. The only thing I think that is quite clear is for me, China now have really changed tact and focus. And they've really almost managed to leverage the negotiation power out of Trump's hands. And with Powell not being as rightly he should be, not playing ball with Trump's requests, and Trump seemingly getting more increasingly frustrated which is leading to much more miscommunication, i.e. changing his view and stance. I think we could potentially be in for more volatility uh, this week and that then creating um, you know, just something to be aware of for your, your intraday strategies going forward. All right, that's it from my part. Let me get Sam on. He can look at the charts in more detail about what he thinks for the week ahead. But I wish you a good one and I'll see you in the chat room um, throughout the week. Thanks very much. Hi uh, guys, good morning. Hope you all had a, uh, a great bank holiday weekend. Just having a, a quick look over the, the pound this morning and 
well, the dollar in, in general, just, just weakening in touch and following Friday's uh, push uh, to the upside. Thursday, Friday, push to the upside. You can see the the pound hit. It's come up to 122.50. Now uh, a fair whack away from that uh, that low that we had uh, back on the, uh, the 12th of the month. Uh, so the pound is testing up at what quite a key level from uh, the trade that we had uh, yesterday, just above the here about. 10 ticks or so, quite a key level, certainly intraday, and then even then above that you've got some nice resistance at 122.71, which I would keep an eye on, and especially when, you know, recently it's been to the downside, but here to the upside now, the pound has recovered a bit. You've got a couple of highs that are just getting lower, so worth having that, that trend on there. You can see you've already got the, the free tests uh, on, the, on the half hour, and we're just, you know, not too far away from testing all of these points of resistance. Uh, if that was all to go, well, you, you've got to imagine the pound, certainly for going into the, the, the early part, mid part of the week, has, has got maybe a bit more to go. And just bringing on here the, the weekly uh, chart uh, of the pound, and you can see, see how we've got this marked up. And, and I mean, I really like the look of a, a short, should we get to you know, coming in around still 124, I think, you know, technically having broken that trend line, that weekly trend line going back to 2017. Just that whole area looks pretty good, uh, along with 124.81 as a maybe more medium-term trade, um, but decent enough bounce. I mean, you could you could argue we've had a test of that 120. Just you know, I think at one point we were about 30 ticks away. Yeah, you can see that 30 ticks away uh, from the, that multi-decade low that we got in 2017. Um, so decent push, and I, I do like the look of a retest of this whole area as a place to. Uh, get short uh, for now uh, just keeping an eye on uh, the 10 ticks or so above a bit of a, a range to the downside obviously for many of these uh, dollar pairs you're going to have where we pushed higher um, well in this case on the on the 22nd from the Macron uh, uh, Merkel rumors I should say uh, but also on Friday for say the euro dollar that previous maybe range that we had uh, in the case of the pound this coming in on the 122 handle before that obviously the lows of the day lows of yesterday but also worth having on same sort of uh, thing as the top just that trend uh, that seems to be containing price for now the euro uh, having a, a brief push and again with the pound it's you just coming up to test some key resistance not to say that this is where we completely break through now as you do have uh, a fair bit just above the pivot at 111.40 uh, as well and see you could argue here this is worth having on this trend line that's cut through yesterday morning to the afternoon and and, and to now as well uh we had obviously that, that big push on friday and i just like we and was saying we had we were saying this morning how he just seemed like he completely lost his head completely lost his head on friday I mean, whether he thought um jerome powell was going to come out and and uh, lower interest rates or, or not, I'm not, not too sure, wouldn't put it past him if he did think that. But the euro uh, strengthened against the dollar, obviously that dollar weakness coming from uh, his attack on the Fed. Ke uh, a pretty key level, that high that we had back on the 15th, uh, that late last night, we have drifted down since. I think really to, to believe we're gonna have another test of that, this trend and that pivot and the high, we're all gonna have to, to go this week. Um, as actually, as we were trading, near the, the low of the morning well we weren't too far again away from you know getting down to those lows of the year which yes do seem uh, further away now uh, but with Trump's easing off the the pressure it might be a uh, favor to, to look again for this market to drift lower um, as well where could that uh, come from I think for to agree with that view rather than say going short higher up uh, you know, a break of these lows and the, the trend that's starting to form from yesterday to this morning could be the opportunity to get short there or, you know, in case uh, it goes higher, let the market tell you that is going to, to go higher as well. Quick look over at, at US stocks and it's, it's quite interesting uh, just having a look at this market on uh, the daily chart and we've, we've mentioned this before but every day and week that goes by it just looks more and more like exactly what we had in October, November. If I just bring that into to picture here, you can see just getting uh, that in the rectangle there. The price section is, is pretty much identical, just squeezed down into less days this time. And you can see uh, that, that trend line going back to October, November, December last year. We just couldn't break above. You could argue that is uh, the highs that we've got now. 
the original uh, low is then uh, lower than the second one and now we get that third one as well so yeah I think from a you know that opportunity to to see a, a big move uh, to the downside it's still definitely on just the way price action is is repeating itself here uh, if we get on the uh, the moving averages you can see the 200 day is is very much still a, a level of support and the the 50 uh, a level of resistance uh, as well um, you can see that that red being the the 50 and the green here the 200 uh, a break of the 200 sure we can get a, a big breakthrough and uh, a, a bigger level as any is that 27 37 to really down to 24 this whole zone here uh, as well but price action looking very very similar i wouldn't really be looking to get long obviously fundamentals can change that but unless we were to break above this trend at the top uh, and that coming in around sort of 40s 29.40 unless it gets above there i'm not interested uh, whereas for now uh, it does seem that we're we're just repeating ourselves if we do take it a bit more uh, intraday uh, and start to put on the uh, the pivots as well and just have a uh, a look at this closer you can see to, to the upside as well you know you've got this key uh, 2890 level which has had good resistant uh, good price action before so I'll be keeping a, a close eye on that but for me unless we were to get above literally today's R2 and close there I'm not too interested to the downside we can see we're just uh, well we failed to break yesterday's high uh, just below the pivot looks like quite an important point 28.55 and below there 42 uh, as well uh, European stocks if we just have a quick look just testing their pivots if they were to go you've got some nice support just below there as well similar to what we just looked at in the S&P if that was to to break down then S1 could come a bit quicker uh, you'd expect to the upside for, for the DAX the morning low before the breakdown uh, at 8 uh, about 26 minutes ago worth keeping an eye on here just marking that with an X and also you can see we're just getting squeezed from the upside so a couple of uh, lines in the sand to be aware of most notably these areas just circle uh, if they were to hold <coughs> or not quick look at gold and oil to, to wrap it you can see the pivot uh, today looks pretty important with yesterday's uh, afternoon and mornings uh, key levels just above their 1547.3 uh, but also to the downside what a level of support this has been over the last 24 uh, hours or so 1535 as good as levels good a line in the sands as you would like for the week ahead if we were to break to the downside and uh, if we were to see further uh, easing off of those Donald Trump tweets and just be aware of any of these previous highs as gold just had such a fantastic Friday uh, before gapping to what's that 1564 on Sunday evening uh, as well I would only get excited to the upside if 1547.3 was to break uh, and then you are looking at those highs from yesterday in the Asian session uh, as well. Oil, uh, you can see here just, well, keep knocking on that 54 door above the pivot but also you've got quite a key level 54.10 from price action wise uh, yesterday. That's something I would, would have marked up and certainly to, to the downside here and we, we talked about in the briefing I think on Friday it was just how we probably prefer technically anyway all to look like it's going to break through as those trend lines from uh, last week held and we are now below them we are just seeing a bit of a trend line break at the moment so as long as we stay below that pivot I think this market could drift lower and then you are looking down at yesterday uh, yesterday's sort of lower levels of support 53 59 from late last night uh, and also the, the low of that week. We'll go into a bit more detail longer term for sure uh, ahead of the midday when we release that strategy. But a couple of interesting points certainly uh, to be aware of. Just one market to finish on here is it's just caught my eyes, the euro pound. Certainly uh, you get where well, you had that retest, I guess, yesterday. Remember that head and shoulders we were talking about, breakthrough, retest, and obviously it's attracted some interest to have got short there. Uh, to the downside, you'd be more comfortable holding this position if that level S1 uh, yesterday's low was all to break as well you can see that trend line just looking like it's going to appear around there uh, as well any questions as usual uh, please uh, do do let us know I hope you've all recovered from the uh, amazing bank holiday and, and England cricketers uh, heroics uh, so if you are Australian I'm, I'm sorry uh, there's still two tests left for you to get something out of it uh, but I hope you'll have a, a great day and a, a great week ahead.